Hello there, my name is Mr Beasley and this video is going to guide you through the first part of chapter 4 of Lord of the Flies which is called Painted Faces and Long Hair. I'm going to do this chapter as with others that I've done in this sequence in stages because as you'll see there is quite a lot to get through and it's certainly possible to make a case that chapter 4 is the most significant in the whole novel. There is a sense, again, that time has moved on, although how much is never made clear. The fact that the title of the chapter is Painted Faces and Long Hair suggests certainly that quite a bit of time is elapsed between chapters three and four, enough time at least for the boy's hair to have grown considerably. They've fallen into a rhythm of everyday life, with the exception of midday when the sun's heat is at its most intense and the boys run for shelter in the shade, perhaps even sleeping. Golding uses the metaphor of a dangerous weapon to describe the power of the sun, a blow that they ducked. It's also described in the second paragraph that I'll show you in just a second of this chapter, using the simile like an angry eye. And this is consistent with the power of the sun mentioned elsewhere in the novel. Apart from the obvious sunburn, it also causes Simon to faint, Percival to have symptoms associated with sunstroke, fits and hallucinations. The sun also has the power to create mirages, which is the first suggestion in the book that what the boys see may not be real. And although I wouldn't make too much of this theme of appearance and reality, it definitely has some relevance to events which happen later. Inevitably, it is Piggy who has the intelligence to explain this learnedly to the others, showing again that he sees things as they are, not as they might be, and his glasses are symbolic of this. Along with the sun, the snapped sharks which roam the reef and the confusion of mirages, there is then the quick dusk followed by darkness which cause fear for the boys. They are menaced by the coming dark and when it arrives it drops on the island like an extinguisher. Think about the heat of the sun, what extinguishers do, this creates a nice bit of textual foreshadowing to the late stages of the novel. Soon in this chapter, Golding confirms the way in which the boys will both be grouped and identified with Littlands at one end of the size scale to Biggins at the other. And I'm just going to point out again that the Littlands are aged from about six years of age with the Biggins, Ralph being at the top, are still only aged from about 12. So if you're listening to this because you're in a secondary school environment, then you need to think of children who are about in year seven. The little ones are largely left to themselves. They ate most of the day, but only where they're able to scavenge fruit from. They know nothing of the ripeness or quality of the food they are eating and as none of the big ones are supervising them, that means picking fruit from the lowest branches of the trees or picking it up from the forest floor. They've become accustomed to the stomach cramps and chronic diarrhoea that this diet causes. They still come to assembly, just like at school, whenever Ralph blows the conch. And this is partly because he was big enough to be a link with the adult world of authority. Although this link to adults is serving Ralph well at the moment, this connection will continue to be made throughout the novel and will ultimately cause him huge problems. The other thing that is worth saying about the Little Ones at this point is the untold terrors that they experienced when night falls, huddling together for comfort. And as I've said before, this isn't the sort of darkness that most of us will have ever experienced. There's no light pollution on this island. So when the sun sets, with the exception of moonlight, there is no light at all. And this allows the imagination of the children to create horrors from the sounds of the nighttime island. Our attention is then taken to a particular group of Litlands who've been building and decorating sandcastles. 
The group consists of Henry, who was the biggest, Johnny, who we're told had a natural belligerence, which basically means that he was badly behaved, perhaps even aggressive, and Percival, who was not very attractive, even to his mother. The other detail given to us about Henry is that he was a distant relative of the boy with the mulberry-coloured birthmark, who died in the fire in chapter 2. Because Henry was the largest of the three Litlands, he's described as being a bit of a leader this afternoon. And as mentioned in a previous video, the behaviour of the older boys is mirrored by the Litlands, just as the behaviour of adults in the world at large is mirrored by the older boys. The fact that Henry is described as being a bit of a leader here is a theme which is picked up in a couple of paragraphs time. For now, we see Roger and Morris coming out of the forest. They've been on duty at the fire and have just finished their shift. So now they've come down from the mountain to the beach and are ready for a swim. Talking about leadership, it's interesting that Roger led the way here. And as he does so, he kicks over any of the little and sand castles that happen to be in his way, burying the flowers and scattering the chosen stones. In other words, Roger led the way to destruction here. And as we'll see later, he does this elsewhere in the story too. Morris follows his lead, kicking over sandcastles too, but he manages, accidentally I think, to get sand into Percival's eye. Now, this is important. Percival starts to cry. And as it says here, in his other life, Morris had received chastisement, uh, a, a telling off for getting sand in a younger child's eye. And even though there are no parents on the island, Morris still responds almost reflexively, like an instinct to his knowledge of doing wrong. And at the back of his mind, he formed the uncertain outlines of an excuse and then trotted off. Morris is still conscious of the rules and boundaries established by the civilised society that he was once a part of. He remembers being punished and so makes an excuse. Not as a fear of being punished, here there is no one to punish him, but as an instinctive response to the civilised society of authority that he is used to. When Morris runs off, Roger remains, ominously, watching the Litlands. And some of the description of Roger here is certainly worth noting. He's got a shock of black hair low on his forehead. And black will always suggest something know, evil, threatening in literature. The added fact that it's low on his forehead means that it's coming close to his eyes. And in later chapters, we'll see Ralph brushing hair away from his eyes too. Eyes and clear sight are a really important symbol in this story. Remember that one of the most important symbols in the whole novel is Piggy's glasses. And this connects Piggy with the idea of good ideas and common sense. The darkness of his hair and the proximity to his eyes is an early suggestion of the way in which Roger's character will develop. So the other older boys have wandered off, but Roger waits behind, observing Henry. And even when Henry gets bored and starts to wander along the beach, Roger follows him. And Henry comes across some tiny, almost microscopic creatures, transparencies, barely visible, that have been brought in by the incoming tide. And Henry comes across some tiny, almost microscopic creatures, transparencies that have been brought in by the coming tide. And Henry 
tries to control them, digging runnels into the sand to guide their motions. And the pleasure that he gets from this is obvious. He is absorbed beyond mere happiness for the simple reason that he is exercising control over living things. So, as I said before, the behaviour of adults is mirrored in the biggins, and the behaviour of biggins is mirrored by the little ones. This isn't an age specific trait. The desire for power and control is just simply part of human nature. So back to Roger. He's hiding himself behind a palm tree when suddenly there is a gust of wind and a load of coconuts as big as rugby balls fall from the tree above him and land thumping around Roger. Roger doesn't think to consider how lucky he is that the coconuts did not hit him. Instead, he looks at the coconuts and then at Henry and then back again. And the significance of this will be made much clearer in later chapters, but for now you need to see how Roger has made a connection between the falling coconuts and Henry. Although Roger doesn't think about his own miraculous escape, he does think about the potential danger. So Roger picks up a stone and throws it at Henry. The important detail here is that he threw it to miss. He continues to throw stones, but there is an area round Henry, perhaps six yards in diameter, into which he dare not throw. And the reason for this is crucial. Round the squatting child was the protection of parents and schools and policemen and the law. Roger remembers the values of right and wrong from the time before he landed on the island. He knows that previously he would have been told off for behaving in this way and therefore dares not break through this invisible wall that is protecting Henry. The word conditioning is mentioned, I've highlighted here, and this is complicated, but it basically refers to the way in which all of us learn right from wrong. You know, we're rewarded for what we do that's good and punished for what we do that's bad. If you feel up to it, try googling an experiment called Pavlov's Dogs, which is probably the most famous experiment into this area of conditioning. The fact that Roger's arm has been conditioned to know that he really shouldn't be throwing stones to actually hit a small child is extra interesting because of course the society which created these rules has been destroyed by the war from which the boys were evacuated which led them to be stranded on the island in the first place. Henry hears the sounds of the stones plopping into the water around him. He's looking for the source of the sound and where the stones are coming from and so the whole thing becomes a bit of a game which he's quite amused by. And Roger is gaining pleasure from this game too, but his is different. Behind a palm tree which he's using to hide himself, having thrown a stone with his eyelids fluttering. There is more than just the enjoyment of a game going on here. Roger is indulging some sort of thrill which will properly be exposed in later chapters. For now, it's probably worth looking up the word sadism because we will need to use this word to describe Roger in later chapters. Roger is taken away from this entertainment by two things. Firstly, the fact that as young children do, Henry eventually loses interest in the game and wanders off. But more significantly is the arrival of Jack, who calls to Roger from beneath a tree about 10 yards away. Jack is described as eager, impatient, beckoning, 
and Roger cannot resist going to him and finding out what Jack wants. Jack is by a pool. Sam, Eric and Bill are with him. Jack is carrying some clay in leaves and he's using the water from the pool to moisten it and then smear it on his face. He's using the different coloured clays to make a mask. And the reason for the creation of this mask is inevitably to do with the hunting of pigs. He explains to Roger that he doesn't think the pigs smell him. He thinks they see him and so he wants to disguise himself using a mask made of different coloured clays. He tries to explain this idea to Roger using a war comparison and in the next sentence there's another reference to the idea that I've spoken of a few times already. The idea of things looking like something else. A detail which could be easily missed here is that the twins move towards Jack and start to protest timidly about something and it won't become clear until later exactly what it is that they're protesting about. But basically they're saying they need to go and take their turn at the signal fire. It's their turn on watch to which Jack turns round and says in this final sentence on this slide, no, you two come with me. After a couple of attempts, Jack is satisfied and looks in the water, no longer at himself, but at an awesome stranger. And the adjective awesome is meant here in the literal sense as something on a grand scale, which is both impressive and terrifying. Jack's mask has made a significant difference to his otherwise civilised personality. A difference which is both impressive and incredibly scary. The impact of the mask is not only on Jack himself, but also on the watching boys. They see Jack laughing excitedly. He starts to dance around and his laughter became a bloodthirsty snarling, like a hungry animal. And the next quotation that I've highlighted here is a really important one, but it is a tricky one. The mask was a thing on its own behind which Jack hid liberated from shame and self-consciousness. And this is actually, when you think about it, probably an idea that many of us can relate to. The idea that when we're in costume or acting in a different role, it means that our own personality, the person that we really are, can be disguised and we end up behaving like the character that we've adopted rather than the person that we really are. And that is what Jack uses the mask for. Remember, he is one of the most privileged and civilised boys on the island. He's failed to kill a pig before, but maybe by adopting this new persona behind the mask, he'll be able to carry it out. The final thing to say here is the interaction between Jack and the twins, which ends this section. Jack commands them with, the rest are making a line, come on! And the twins protest because, as I said before, they are supposed to be going up the mountain, taking their turn to keep the fire going. But the mask that Jack wears compels them. Jack commands them and the twins fall into line behind Jack to hunt pigs on the other side of the island. <laughs>